I'm standing in for Morgan King and Anne Marie Dugan. Today, we're going to take a closer look at one of the most heinous mass murders ever to take place in the state of Tennessee. I'm talking about the Lily Lid murders. On April 6, 1997, a young married couple from Powell, Tennessee, and their children, a six-year-old girl and a two-year-old little boy, were kidnapped at a rest stop on Interstate 81 in Greene County and taken to a gravel road where all four were brutally gunned down. I've covered this story for WKPT News since it broke, but each day my time was limited to two or three minutes per newscast, and I wasn't able to present the whole story. That's why we're here today. Most of the details will involve the killers, and I'm going to warn parents right now, we're dealing with intense subject matter that may not be suitable for children. The focus is on the six Kentuckians, not to give them undue attention, but to examine what we know about their lives, to find out how they became killers, and maybe somewhere in the debris, there's a lesson for all of us. With that in mind, let's proceed. We begin with a news conference held by Greene County Sheriff Terry Jones the morning after the Lily Lid's bodies were found. The officers arrived at the scene. They found uh, a male and female laying in a ditch that had uh, what appeared to be multiple gunshot wounds uh, to the uh, head and to the chest area. Uh, also, two small children were found. Each adult was holding one with uh, also gunshot wounds to their head. Were the Lily Lid murders the result of a senseless frenzy or a calculated ritual? Legal experts involved in the case say we may never know. The family was found just minutes after they were gunned down on a little gravel road in Baileyton, Tennessee. Vidar and Delphina Lillilid were laying side by side in a shallow ditch with their toes pointed toward the road. Their children, six-year-old Tabitha and two-year-old Peter, were lying across their parents' chests, forming crosses. This struck investigators as strange, but they wouldn't find out until later just how strange this case could get. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you should give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth that help you God? According to forensic pathologist Dr. Cleland Blake, some of the bullet wounds found on Vidar and Delphina Lillilid formed patterns. Besides several random shots, Vidar had also been shot three times in the chest, each wound forming the point of a triangle. The same for Delphina, but her triangle was in her abdomen. Later testimony revealed that uh, triangles were used in blood rituals held by the people who eventually pleaded guilty to killing the Lily Lids. In fact, the triangles were used the night before the murders in a ritual inside this Kentucky hotel room to ask for Satan's protection. From what, we don't know, but prosecutors would insinuate the group was preparing to commit murder in order to police their demons. And all the players were there. 20-year-old Joseph Reisner, 19-year-old Dean Mullins, 18-year-old Natasha Cornett, 18-year-old Crystal Sturgill, 17-year-old Karen Howell, and 14-year-old Jason Bryant. That's how it all began. After the ritual in the wee hours of Sunday morning, the group went on a shoplifting spree at Walmart, then went to Natasha's house where she lived with her mother to get some sleep. Fear of being arrested for vandalizing the hotel room the night before forced the six to make plans to leave town. So when they woke up Sunday afternoon, they crowded into Reisner's car and headed south. In just a few hours, they would meet the Lily Lids at a rest stop. That chance meeting would have a tragic end. When the six were arrested two days later at the Mexican border in Arizona, they were in the Lily Lids van. And a glimpse of the items inside that van was our first illustration of two very different worlds that had fatally collided. A photo album with lewd pictures that the killers carried with them was laying open on top of a child's toy, a doll that had once belonged to a six-year-old little girl named Tabitha. Okay, do you have any questions, Miss Cornette? We got our first real glimpse at some of the killers when an Arizona judge reviewed their case You're via right. teleconference. These would become familiar faces that would haunt many people for the rest of their lives. These were the last faces the little lids saw before they die. Because I think that they ought to take them people, hang them up somewhere, slash them with a whip, or beat them, take turns until they die a slow and painful death. I don't think they ought to get killed quickly because that's just letting them off too easy. The four adult defendants waived extradition and were immediately returned to Tennessee. An angry mob gathered at the Greene County Jail to greet them. They should have been made walk from Arizona barefooted, I think. Blisters on their feet and then busted them. It's just the awfulest thing that ever happened. I came down here to see 
who would be crazy enough to kill little kids, man? And we want to see, you know, we want to see the little smarts on their face, and we want to see justice done. No such crowd would be on hand to greet the younger defendants. Attorneys appointed to represent Jason Bryant and Karen Howell in Arizona tried to fight extradition. So the youngsters were not sent back to Tennessee with the adults. But that fight was unsuccessful. On a Friday afternoon, an Arizona judge approved extradition. And Greene County deputies took the juveniles on Saturday before Arizona attorneys could file an appeal to that ruling on Monday morning. Bryant and Howell were greeted by a host of television cameras and reporters in Greenville, but no mob. Before Howell and Bryant arrived in Greene County, the older defendants were arraigned for first-degree murder. The day of that arraignment generated a media circus. Reporters from all over came to cover the hearing, even from as far away as Vidar's home country of Sweden. On the day of the arraignment, the defendants were escorted one by one to a small courtroom from an upstairs jail by armed guards as television photographers jostled for position in a small lobby. One of those defendants would quickly emerge as a so-called leader. That was Natasha Cornett. A Kentucky attorney named Eric Kahn was hired to represent Cornett from the first. The brash young counselor bucked convention when he openly talked to reporters about his client. It soon became evident he was going for the shock factor. Yes, they all share blood on as a regular basis as a matter of bonding. Uh, it's a blood, they also had a have regular frenzies with blood and um, kind of a sexual erotic frenzy that they have to have. Khan's openness about bizarre rituals and self-mutilation was scorned by the attorneys assigned to represent the other defendants. They believed Khan was turning the case into a three-ring circus and he would later be removed as Natasha's attorneys because of these tactics. But until he was removed, Khan stuck to his strategy, and he encouraged Natasha to expand on her fascination with the dark arts whenever possible. Reporters sent lists of questions to Natasha while she was in jail. In her answers, Natasha stated she believed she was a daughter of Satan. That claim would stick to her in future reports on the Little Lid murders, both local and national. When we return, we'll take a closer look at Natasha Cornett and her life before the murders. Stay with us. Due to intense subject matter, this program may not be suitable for young children. Despite media reports to the contrary, Natasha denied she was the leader of the group. But as each defendant took the witness stand at the sentencing hearings, it became clear that Natasha was at least the catalyst that brought them all together. And it was also clear that she was the leader in the bizarre rituals the group participated in. Investigators found piles of occult paraphernalia in Natasha's bedroom after the murders. And for them, it explained the mystery of the lily lid bodies being laid out in the forms of crosses. A Ouija board, several spell books, and vampire game books were just a few of the items investigators found. Between the arraignment and the final sentencing hearing, three of the six defendants dramatically changed their appearance. Dean Mullins trimmed his hair and opted for a closer shave. It gave him a clean-cut look, returning his appearance to that of a studious young man. Crystal Sturgill cut off her long hair. The effect? She looked harmless as a librarian. But the most startling change was the one affected by Joe Reisner. The young man who many came to think of as a co-leader of sorts cut off his long hair. He was instantly transformed from a frightening apparition to a seemingly frightened young man. So if you look at the overall picture in this case, it, it, it can cause you to go into withdrawal. But uh, if, if you focus on, on air, one or two areas at a time, I think we can, we can all uh, rest a lot better with what we're doing. Judge James Beckner decided to try all six defendants together. It would have been the largest trial in Tennessee history, and preparations were massive. But Beckner pushed attorneys to the limit, setting strict deadlines for weekly updates. This schedule, however, would be nothing compared to the trial itself. Jury selection was set to begin February 23rd, and the trial would last four to six weeks. As that trial date approached, everyone was busy getting ready. Attorneys, defendants, victims, family and friends, witnesses, and the media all were set to spend more than a month in Greenville. But it was not to be. At the last possible moment on the last business day before jury selection, all six defendants decided to change their pleas from not guilty to guilty. Are you all pleading guilty because you are guilty? Yes. yes. And I want each defendant to... To answer that individually, um, Ms. Sturgill? Yes. 
Mr. Mullins? Yes. Mr. Risen? Yes. Mr. Bryant? Yes. Ms. Cornett? Yes. Ms. Howell? Yes. The adults did it to avoid the death penalty for which all were eligible. The youngsters did it in hopes they would get leniency from the court during sentencing. These guilty pleas meant everyone would skip a trial and go straight to the sentencing phase when the judge would hand down a punishment against the newly confessed killers. Attorneys scrambled to switch gears. They would do everything they could to garner sympathy for the clients in an effort to soften the blow. The sentencing hearing is where we found out about the killers, what their lives were like from the earliest age. The four defendants, who according to testimony, played the biggest role in the murders, each took the stand in their own defense to tell the judge their side of the story. Please state your full name for the court, please. <coughs> Natasha Leanne Wallen Cornett. It was almost painful to listen to the details of Natasha Cornett's childhood. She was isolated with a sickly mother who physically abused her and a string of would-be fathers who abandoned her. I just remember, like, when she was fixing my hair um, before daycare, she would, like, get real upset, and she'd start pulling it out and dragging me by the hair of the head, and sometimes she'd hit me in the head with the brush and stuff like that and throw brushes and stuff at me. Wow, what, what did you do? I don't know. I mean, she said that I sassed her, but I don't remember doing it. She'd, like, hit me with her fist, or she'd grab whatever was near her and hit me with that. You know what a spanking is? Uh, I guess you call it that in Kentucky. That's what we call it down here, spanking, whipping, whatever. Yeah. With a, a belt or a switch or a fly swatter or a... And these little floppy bedroom shoes, something like that. But that's not what you're talking about. No. Uh -huh. Right. You're talking about hitting with a fist. Yeah. Okay. And she, your mom would do this on, is it rare? No. Occur a whole lot? Yeah. What was your relationship like with your mother between the ages of five and ten? Not good. I was scared of her. I mean. Why, why were you scared of her? <clears throat> Well, I knew she could hurt me, but I was more scared of her leaving because that's, like, what she threatened to do more was to leave me. Just take off and leave? Yeah. When Natasha became a teenager, the lifetime of turmoil began bearing its fruit. Natasha started dressing in dark clothing. She dropped out of school and... She took over the task of abusing herself. When did you start cutting yourself? Um, I think sixth grade. Sixth grade? Yeah. Where did you cut yourself then? My ankles. Your ankles. How many cuts do you have on your arms, legs, and anything? I don't know. A lot? Yeah. We've all seen the pictures up and down your arm. Why do you do that? Um, to release, like, emotional pain. Natasha's mother, Madonna Wallen, tearfully recalled the day she found out about her daughter's self-mutilation. She was in the middle bedroom. She was sitting in the middle of the bed. She had a razor blade, and she cut her arm. And I said, Natasha, please don't do that. And she said, Mommy, that's the only way I can get rid of the pain. She said, just go away and leave me alone. I'll be okay. That's what she got herself is to get rid of the pain. And I don't even know what the pain was. On the witness stand, Madonna admitted that despite the shock over seeing her daughter slice her own oh, arms, really? the mother continued to let Natasha do as she pleased. The girl's friends would come over and stay for days at a time, including Dean Mullins, Crystal Sturgill, Karen Howell, and Joe Reisner. They were allowed to drink alcohol and do drugs, and when the group retired to Natasha's room, Madonna never asked any questions. And when she would bring those people home, did you allow them to drink? I didn't really know what they were doing back there in the bedroom. That was her room, and I guess they did drink sometimes, yeah. Man, wouldn't it be fair to say that they brought alcohol in, that, that they would pass you at some point before they got back there? Yeah. So it was 
it's something you tolerate it. Yeah, to keep her home. Just days after the Lilith murders, Madonna Wallen spoke privately with WKPT News at her home in Betsy Lane, Kentucky. She spoke of spirits that whispered in her daughter's ear and Natasha's strange declaration that she wanted to start Armageddon. If they did, you know, go and, and do a seance and they did think they could uh, start the Armageddon, I know a lot of people don't believe in uh, demons and the, you know, the powers of the dark, but they're very real. And that's all I can, the only excuse that I can give for those children doing that is that they just conjured up something that took over them completely and it was a demon force. It was news of the murders that finally moved Madonna to action. She says she tore apart Natasha's bedroom and burned several items of her daughter's occult paraphernalia. We did find a pile of ashes in the backyard, supposedly Natasha's freshly burned Ouija board. And we had to get past Natasha's black dog named Evil to shoot video of that pile. Just as a visit to this house convinced investigators that the occult was a major factor in this case, our own visit also convinced us Natasha was deeply involved in black magic. And from the witness stand, during her sentencing hearing, the young woman confirmed it. Hers was a different religion, one in which she embraced evil. What's the difference between my God and your God? Well, a Christian's God is supposed to be like pure and good and does nothing wrong. And my God is not completely pure or good. He's like a yin-yang, I guess. But the murders weren't enough to make Natasha change her ways. Prosecutors produced a letter written by Natasha while she was in jail. In it, she asked a friend to perform a blood ritual to ask Satan to have the murder charges against her dropped. Despite her dark leanings and the terrible murders, the stories about Natasha's childhood, verified by relatives, almost swayed the judge. When passing sentence, Beckner wavered between giving the girl simple life in prison and life without parole. But even as he spoke about his indecision in open court, Beckner seemed to talk himself right into a verdict. I don't think I have any choice in the case. As far as you're concerned, Ms. Cornette, but to sentence you in each of counts 18, 19, and 20, to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. We'll hear from the rest of the Lilalid killers right after this. Due to intense subject matter, this program may not be suitable for young children. Karen Howell was just 17 years old when the Lilalids were killed. Like Natasha, she also suffered abuse as a child, but hers was sexual abuse at the hands of an uncle and his son. Before she began her testimony, Howell asked to have her family removed from the courtroom. They did leave, but the group gathered around television monitors being used by reporters in the courtroom lobby to listen as Howell described her life. Howell's mother was a devoutly religious woman, but at the age of 14, Karen Howell rebelled. She began dabbling in witchcraft, first white magic or Celtic magic, then dark. Did you first begin with the Ouija board? Yes. And after the Ouija board, you got into automatic writing? Yes. Now, so his honor can understand, automatic writing is when you call upon spirits to enter you. No. Spirits do enter you in automatic writing, don't they? Yes, but you don't have to call upon them to get them to come in to you. <clears throat> Things got so bad that Karen's mother finally brought in preachers to perform an exorcism, but to no avail. The girl's obsession with the spirit world increased, causing her to lose touch with reality. On the witness stand, Karen told about one particular spirit named Jonathan Alexander Dimitri. She started seeing Jonathan just seven months before the murders. Usually when you want to see Jonathan, all you have to do is close, close your eyes. eyes. Yes. And most of the time you think of a question and he communicates with you by nodding or shaking his head. Yes. <clears throat> He's not the only hallucination that you've had, is he? Not when I close my eyes, no. 
Sometimes when you do, you see black shadows. Yes. <clears throat> Things in your mind lighten up. Yes. <clears throat> Everything turns red. Yes. And you see people walking around. Spirits, yes. Do you see the spirits of the Lily Lynn family? No. Karen's familiarity with the occult made her an ideal companion for Natasha. They would frequently drink one another's blood to bring them closer. Prosecutors tried to characterize the girls as being lovers, but both vehemently denied the accusation, claiming they were more like sisters. Whatever the relationship, Natasha was clearly the dominant personality. When this gruesome group met up with the Lily Lids at the I-81 rest stop, Karen seemed to be floating along disconnected from the goings-on around her, and Natasha seemed to be guiding her. Listen to her describe her reactions as those events played out. First, when they began talking about taking the Lily Lids van. Natasha and I were standing in that Joe's car smoking, and Natasha said, you want to steal that van? And I said, no, you do it, and she said, no, you do it. When Natasha wanted to go listen to Reisner's discussion with Vidar at the picnic tables. They all went up there, and Natasha turns to me and says that she's going to go with them, make sure that they wouldn't hurt them. <coughs> she asked me if I want to go, too, and I said, yeah. When Natasha decided to ride in the van while Reisner and Bryant kidnapped the Little Lid family. Everyone started walking toward the van, and Natasha said that she was going to ride with them, so they wouldn't hurt them. She said... Was I going to go with her? And I said, I guess. And finally, after the murders. I think at that point, I like hunched over in the seat and turned to face the window and just closed my eyes. But perhaps Karen's biggest effort to remove herself from her circumstances came while the murders were actually being committed. She testified that Jason Bryant started shooting the family with one gun, and she was sitting in the little lid van with another gun on the floor when Jason returned to the van. If I understand you correctly, you told his honor that he did the shooting with the 25 first. Yes. And then he started shooting with the 9mm. Yes. But before he could start shooting with the 9mm, he had to come back to the van. Yes. And get it. Yes. Where you were. Yes. You had access to it. I didn't see the gun until he came and grabbed it. I wasn't paying attention to a gun. The judge made little hesitation when he handed down Karen's sentence of life in prison Including without parole. Joe Reisner also took the stand in his own defense. It was Reisner who Vidar Lily Lid was witnessing to on that fateful day. It was Reisner who pulled a gun on Vidar. It was Reisner who forced Vidar to drive his family to that lonely road in Baileyton. It was Reisner who ran over the bodies of the Lily Lids as the group made its getaway. And it was Reisner who was the only one to yes, apologize to his victim's family. I'd like to apologize because I know that I helped put, the, put them into that situation where they got hurt. And I know that they'll never be back. And I'm so sorry that we did this. I'm just sorry. Reisner's childhood is not littered with stories of abuse and witchcraft. He did come from a broken home, and he started using drugs and alcohol at an early age. But it was Reisner's romantic entanglements with first Natasha, then Karen, that brought him into this strange group. But he says he didn't witness one of the girls' blood rituals until like just a ritual. week before the and murders. They sat on the floor in front of each other, and they were, like, cutting their arms. And they were, like, laughing. They were, like, giggling and talking to each other. And, I mean, it didn't seem serious at all. They, like, dripped the blood in a cup, and they were, like, giggling and talking to each other the whole time. I mean, it was just like a bonding experience for them or something is what it looked like to me. Did it worry you? Well, yeah. Why? Because I love Karen, and I didn't want her to hurt herself. Like Natasha and Karen before him, Reisner told Judge Beckner the youngest member of their group, then 14-year-old Jason Bryant, did all the shooting. I walked back towards the van and I opened the driver's door and I started to get in. And that's when I heard the first shot. Did you turn around and look what had happened? Yes. I jerked my head around and I saw Mr. Lillard fall to the ground. Who was standing in front of him with a gun? Jason was standing in front of him, and he had the 9 millimeter in his hand.
What did he do next? I heard another shot, and I saw Mrs. Lillywood turn to her side, and she fell to the ground. What did you do? <laughs> I jumped into the van, and I closed the, closed the door, and I started to cry. And my first thought when the door closed, I heard like a, started to hear like a burst go off. And I thought, oh my God, they're dead. As part of his plea for leniency, Reisner's attorney told Judge Beckner that the young man's life would be a living hell in prison, even if he received the lighter sentence of life with parole. None of the defendants, he said, would be eligible to get out of prison until the year 2050, and Reisner was not going to enjoy those years behind bars. The young man, it seemed, had already received anonymous letters from inmates at Brushy Mountain State Prison promising the, quote, baby killer a warm welcome when he arrived. But the judge had no pity. There's a lot of torture and abuse of these people on the way to their murder uh, when they were crying and begging and pleading and singing. But uh, especially as in count number 18, as to Delphina Lily Lid, I find that uh, she, the proof is that she was still alive when you ran over her. and that you did that intentionally. Now, as to count number 20, I find that Tabitha Lillivid was still alive and watched her parents being shot and killed. Reisner was sentenced to life in prison without parole, and two days later, he was shipped off to Brush him out. Still to come, the youngest and perhaps most deadly member of the Kentucky Six takes the stand. Don't go away. Due to intense subject matter, this program may not be suitable for young children. Stay in there, Jason. Speak up loudly so everybody can hear you. The only other defendant to take the witness stand was Jason Bryant. In fact, Bryant was the first to testify, and according to his version of the story, Joe Reisner and Dean Mullins did all the killing, and then forced him to take the blame. He said, what about you? Would you take the blame for it? And I said, I don't know. I don't know how much time I can get, and this ain't like school. I started telling him like that, and he told me that I could only be held until I'm 18. Then they had to let still, me go. Are you afraid of Joe at this point? Yes. Okay. Then what happened? Well, I said I'd have to think about it, and when it did, Dean asked me, let me see your hand like that. And when I went, put my hand out, he pulled out a gun, the 25, and shot me. Jason's attorney made this claim the they focal knew, point of his arguments. That it was the adult's plan. Let the juvenile take the rap. And I submit to you, Your Honor, it worked. The adults' plan worked. The adults are out of the electric chair. Attorney General says that there was no direct proof of anybody shooting other than the juvenile. Because there was so much focus on Jason being framed for the murders, we only got a glimpse of Jason's past life. He lived with his father and brother in Kentucky, and unlike his co-defendants, he had a prior juvenile record. This record was used to support claims by other attorneys that Bryant was not the patsy he claimed to be, but a dangerous monster. He's mean, and it's going to be shown that he's mean, and he shot these people, and that's the reason those people over there are not on trial for their lives. To refute this claim, one psychological expert took the stand in Jason's defense. In a nutshell, the doctor claimed Jason was too uneducated and socially underdeveloped to have been a leading figure in this motley crew. He's just operating socially way down the scale. Not, we call it not age appropriate. Mm -hmm. And that's going to show when these seasoned lawyers get a chance to cross-examine him here today. Be on yeah. shooting fish in a barrel. But the judge didn't buy it. I don't know who all were the shooters. I think there was more than one. I have seen no real remorse or emotion displayed by you. I find the evidence shows that you were aggressing, that you were aggressive in the killings, that you helped use a gun to kidnap the little Liz in the first place. The youngest of the six defendants, Jason Bryant, was sentenced to life in prison without parole. 
Dean Mullins and Crystal Sturgill did not testify in their own behalf, but family and friends did. Of the six, they had the best chance of getting a lenient sentence. According to testimony, they did not ride in the van when the Lily Lids were being kidnapped, but instead followed behind in Reisner's car. And according to all testimony except for Bryant's, they stayed in that car while the Lily Lids were being shot. Of all the defendants, Crystal Sturgill was perhaps the most pitiable. Testimony shows that her family practically pushed Crystal into the company of Natasha Cornett. Four months before the Lily Lids were killed, Crystal asked a school guidance counselor for help, saying she'd been sexually abused by her stepfather since the age of five. That counselor notified authorities. What did you do as a result of that allegation? I went and uh, spoke to the stepfather. Where did you speak to him at? At his home. Uh, same day? The same day, yes. When you spoke to him, what did he tell you? He told me that uh, he had had sex with her about ten times. Asking for help got Crystal away from her stepfather, but into another problem. Crystal's family refused to believe her allegations and would not let the girl live in any of their homes. But a friend had a solution. We'll show the court, and the court has records that, that go through the sequence of events that led to her uh, meeting her old friend Dean Mullins or seeing him and, and uh, one resource, one place to stay for a while was with Natasha Cornett and Madonna, her mother. And basically she was permitted to be there for a while. Natasha became Crystal's closest friend, including the girl and everything, even the blood rituals. That was how Crystal Sturgill came to be in the company of killers on April 6th, 1997. But for leaving that home, Your Honor, but for that allegation, I have a client that could be a freshman in college this year. And she knows she lost that. She knows the consequences of, of being with these folks and of joining in that great adventure of going on a road trip and getting a vehicle and the rest was a surprise and a horror to her just as it is to everyone else we think the evidence supports how she came to be at the uh and natasha cornett's place to stay for a while and that the record also supports that um, the mitigators in this case are such that the court should consider a life sentence and we believe that the evidence will uh, sustain that her minor role in this terrible tragedy is such that that should also mitigate towards a life sentence thank you but in the end judge Beckner held crystal responsible for her own actions or rather for her own inaction. You had many chances to get away, many chances to report to authority. You had you left a baby for dead at the scene of this crime. Like her co-defendants before her, Crystal Sturgill was also sentenced to life in prison without parole. If any one defendant's involvement sparks confusion, it is that of Dean Mullins. There were no stories of abuse or neglect offered on his behalf. His father painted a picture of a normal young man who was involved in school and in his church youth group. In fact, Randy Mullins testified that the boy was in church every time the doors opened. Every Sunday, every Wednesday night, every Sunday night, um, Friday night youth meeting. So that's four times a week? Yes, sir. But somewhere along the way, Dean Mullins got off track and started dating a girl he met at school named Natasha. We never found out how or why Dean became involved with a young woman who embraced the opposite of everything he'd been taught to believe. But testimony by all the defendants showed Dean attended the blood rituals and did not raise protest when the Lily Lids were first abducted, then killed. In fact, Jason says Dean was an active participant in the shooting. By the time I looked over at Joe and asked him what was going on, he just turned around and started pulling the trigger. Where'd the first shot hit? Mr. Lillard's right eye. What, who, what else happened after that? How many, how many shots did he fire? I heard about three shots because I closed my eyes since that shot, first shot hit. Did he say anything to Mr. Mowens? 
No, he slapped him on the shoulder, and Dean raised up the gun very slowly. Did he shoot? Yes, they both shot at the same time. And according to Jason, after the lily lids were killed, Dean shot him in the hand in order to convince Jason to take the blame for the murders. But Karen, Natasha, and Joe say Dean never touched a gun. Before leaving the witness stand, the boy's father made an impassioned apology to the lily lids family. In fact, later that family told reporters his was the only apology they believed was sincere. To the lily lid family, my heart bleeds for you. I'm so sorry that this happened, and if I could change it, I would. You're constantly in my prayers. I never stop thinking about you from day to day. Thank you, and may God bless you. But a father's plea could not save a son. You participated in the getaway and the cover-up. You were in the van for two days with little lid property, a baby seat under your feet, children's toys and I find therefore that the sentences should be in each of the three counts of first-degree murder life without the possibility of parole I further find that those sentences should be served consecutively when we come back the defendants who testified tell the judge how the lily lids were killed. Due to intense subject matter, this program may not be suitable for young children. The sentencing hearing lasted four days, and the judge's final decisions brought closure to a community that desperately needed it. However, the judge and the prosecutor in this case say we'll probably never know what really happened to the lily lids. They believe the defendants lied on the witness stand. However, in this final segment of our special, we are going to take a look at what those defendants claim happened on April 6, 1997. Late on a Sunday afternoon, Vidar Lililid and his family were on their way home from a Jehovah's Witness conference in Johnson City and stopped at this rest area on Interstate 81, just north of the Baileyton exit. As fate would have it, another group of travelers stopped at the rest area at the same time. Six teenagers that wanted to steal a van so they could travel cross-country in comfort and not crowded into a broken-down compact car. It was Natasha Cornett who first broached the subject of stealing the Lily Lids van. And I looked over and I seen like a van and there was like nobody around it. And I asked Karen if she wanted to go steal it. But it was Jason Bryant and Joe Reisner who decided to carry out the theft. Unaware that he was a prospective victim, Vidara Lililid tried to share his faith with a motley band of teenagers. Joe Reisner feigned interest, and the group began laying their trap. He was like, uh, well, you know, we want to go over and sit down at the picnic table and talk about it. And I was like, yeah, okay. They were uh, talking, um, Joe and Vidara, and about God or whatever. And... Uh, I was talking to um, Delphina and Tabitha, and Tabitha um, uh, gave me and Karen a Hershey's kiss. Natasha, like, rises up and says, I think we should leave. And that's when Joe put down the gun, the 9 millimeter. He says, I'm sorry I have to do this to you, but he said, Everyone stay calm. We're just going to take a little ride. No one will get hurt. Walk slowly to the van. Mr. Lily got, like, he was he was visibly scared. Um, the little boy didn't seem to be, he didn't even seem to know what was going on. Um, Mrs. Lily was really shaken. I mean, she was tore up. She started, like, talking stuff. And the little girl was crying. In the van, Vidar was ordered to start driving at gunpoint while his wife and children huddled in the back with a gun also pointed at them. When we get in the van, Delfina <laughs> Delfina said, please don't hurt us. And that's when Jason took out the 25 millimeter, uh, not millimeter, but caliber pistol and uh, pointed at Tabitha and Delfina. Delfina started singing 
to calm T Tabitha down, and Jason told her to shut up. She had taught Tabitha about guns, and that's why she was so scared. I told her it would be okay, that nobody would hurt her. And I promised I wouldn't leave anybody hurt her. The horrifying drive didn't last long. Three miles down the interstate, Fidar was ordered to take the Baileyton exit, then to turn onto this gravel road, Paint Hollow Road. And Joe told everybody to get out of the van. And <clears throat> Karen said, just let them get their stuff and go. Mr. Lillard and Mrs. Lillard and the two children were standing in a ditch kind of in front of the car. He was standing beside Delphina and he was, he didn't have Tabitha in his arms. Tabitha was standing directly in front of him. Okay. And he was, had her, had his arm around her. Tabitha was crying again. And Jason said, make her shut up. And Vidar put his hand over her mouth. Vidar took out his wallet and said, Take her money and take the vans. Don't hurt us. Jason was asking Joe, what do you think we should do? You think we should let him go? Or you think we should kill him? And Joe said, I don't know, man. What do you think that we should do? And he said, I think we should kill him. I remember Natasha, like, trying to make Jason promise not to hurt the little kids. I started begging Jason not to do it. And, and he just wouldn't listen. And I knew somebody was going to die. So I walked over in front of the family. And, and I told them that I couldn't stop him from killing someone. So please don't let him hurt the kids. Will you please give me the kids so he won't hurt them? The daughter, like, um tightens his grip on Tabitha, like he has one of his hands over her mouth because she was crying really bad. And um, he has an arm around Tabitha and he tightened his grip on him and after he said, if we let him go, do I already be dead or something like that? Fedora said, if we die, then the kids will be hurt anyways. And I turn around. I said, please stop this. Next thing I remember, I heard Jason shooting. I remember he had the 25 the first time. And I remember he shot the daughter first. I heard another shot, and I saw Mrs. Lillard turn to her side, and she fell to the ground. What did you do? <laughs> I jumped into the van, and I closed the closed the door, and I started to cry. I looked over at the car, and Crystal had her hands on her face, and Dean bowed down his head, and then I looked away. I remember Jason yelling, saying they're still effing alive. He grabbed the nine out of the floor, and he ran out, and I looked back, and Tabitha? What was she doing? She was standing over her mother. What did Jason do? I yelled no. And uh, he went right up to her. Um, he went right up to her and shot her. He shot them all over again. When he came back, I 
when he came back, he was laughing. <laughs> and he said that Delfina was laying there speaking in tongues. And the door was jerking really bad. He said that he had to shoot him all over again. I sat there for a minute and I tried to kind of get a grip. And um, I pulled the van forward and I started, I pulled the van forward until I saw this house up there. And I think I said, oh, sh um, S-H. There's a effing house up there or something. And I started to turn the van around like really quickly. I mean, I was like ramming the sides of the ditch and stuff. I was staring at the steering wheel and I seen it jerk to the, I seen Joe jerk it to the right and we ran over something. And I turned around and I looked in the back window and we had ran over them. And, uh, and Jason said, that little girl looks like she just got effed. She's all sprawled out. And he was laughing about it. And that is the closest account we have of what happened to Vidar, Delfina, Tabitha, and Peter Lily Lid on that terrible day. The people who lived in the house up the road called 911 when they heard shooting, and deputies found their Lily Lids minutes later. The children were still alive and were rushed to the UT Medical Center in Knoxville, but Tabitha died from a gunshot wound to the head the next day. Peter would be the only survivor. Two gunshot wounds, one to the chest and another to the eye, will leave him disabled for the rest of his life. But, that, but the fact that he has a life to live is miraculous. Vidar's sister from Sweden and Delfina's sister from Florida each fought for custody of Peter. And even before his family's killers were sentenced to spend the rest of their lives behind bars, three-year-old Peter was beginning a new life in Sweden with his new family. As for those killers, the judge stated in open court he did not believe Jason Bryant was the only shooter. The Greene County District Attorney who handled this case, Barkley Bell, told us he doesn't believe the stories told by Natasha Cornett, Karen Howell, or Joe Reisner, or even Bryant's standalone account of what happened. He believes the Kentucky Six set out to kill as part of a ritual, and all of them had a hand in the murders. Prosecutors outlined several more occult findings we didn't touch on in our story, such as the fact that both Vidar and Peter were shot in the right eye, and that the right eye has some sort of significance in the occult or the fact that a group of six committed murder on April 6th and marked two of their victims with three-pointed triangles equaling six, or that five of the six defendants each had something that belonged to the Lily Lids in their possession when they were caught in Arizona. Tabitha's Hello Kitty locket, a picture of Tabitha, Peter and Delphina's social security cards. Barkley Bell would allege that in their dark world, carrying something that belonged to the dead gave special powers and that somehow killing children would earn some sort of bizarre extra credit. However, both Natasha and Karen denied those allegations. Several contradictions in testimony also contributed to a lack of belief. There are discrepancies about which gun Jason used first, the 9mm or the 25 caliber handgun. And there is a discrepancy about who was shot first. Karen and Joe say it was Vidar. Natasha says it was Delfina, even though all claim that they saw it happen. Joe Reisner says Natasha was the one who told him to take the van and told him to use the gun, then directed Vidar about where to go. Joe says he tried to get Natasha to stop, but Natasha told the judge she was the one who tried repeatedly to stop that chain of events. And the chain does continue to destroy lives today. On April 29th, Jason Bryant's father, Arlen Bryant, was found hanging from a tree. He had apparently committed suicide. Family members told investigators in Pike County, Kentucky, that Bryant had been, quote, despondent after his son pleaded guilty to the Lily Lid murders. All six defendants have filed for post-conviction relief. That means they're going to ask the Knoxville Criminal Court of Appeals to reduce their sentences. As of this date, that court has not scheduled a hearing in the cases. And finally, as we mentioned at the beginning of this program, this presentation was not put together to shock, but hopefully to teach. 
If you're the parent of a teenager and heard any stories about any type of situation or behavior that you've been ignoring as a simple phase, you may want to take a closer look. Maybe we can learn from the mistakes of others and keep a tragedy like this one from happening again. Thanks for watching. Thank you.